Hi, um, my company uh, is Bluestone Wine Solutions, but I started my first importing business, the Australian Wine Connection, in 1992, 23 years ago, when the US looked very different from today in terms of the wine industry. Most people had never heard of Australian wines. Um, there were a couple of uh, lower end, shall we say, um, generic wines, and it was way before Yellowtail. Into this climate, I began with a small, small portfolio of tiny production, completely unknown brands, with esoteric sounding names at the time, like Semyon and Gewürztraminer. And it included my family's also unknown estate from uh, the region of Kaura. I think I was the prime example of the expression, ignorance is bliss. Now, it was a, it was a very challenging time, um, obviously. Uh, people uh, weren't aware even of, of Australian wine, much less regions. Um, this was what it uh, sort of looked like. It's the old model. Uh, there were fewer importers. There were more distributors. Uh, distributors were not usually also importers. There was no internet, which was a, um, a pro and a con. Um, the, uh, it was definitely a boon for importers who wanted to uh, charge whatever they wanted to for, their, for the wines. Um, there was no way to research uh, importers or distributors or, or your competitors. Um, there was less awareness of world regions, much less. Um, greater opportunity in, in some areas. And when I say no internet, I mean people didn't have websites and, you know, they, it, it certainly wasn't the, um, um, the expansive uh, uh, area it is now. There was greater opportunity in some areas for new brands because there, were, um, there weren't uh, the uh, diversification there is now. But it had to be the right thing. There was less sophistication and there were um, lower price points. Those were the norms. So when I would call um, distributors and ask them if they had any Australian wines, uh, they'd say something like, yes, I have one, thanks. And that would be it. Or they'd say, what do you have that's going to retail for $5.99? There was certainly no discussion of, of regionality or, uh, or styles or anything else. It was simply, uh, let me tick that box, and if I want an Australian wine, that's what it had to be. Um, now, then, of course, we, um, it took off uh, with, the, with the, the, the high-rated wines of Parker. Um, it became a very, very um, heady time for Australian wines. Um, a great wave of popularity, um, and it sort of was its own worst enemy because they ended up being very monolithic Shiraz, high-end uh, wines that sort of fell apart. And along with the recession, the um, Australian wine industry um, fell into de decline as an exported brand to the U.S. Um, the exchange rates weren't favourable, and um, in general, people weren't um, spending for higher-end wines. Um, so then we... Um, um, today we have uh, a newer model. There are more importers. Uh, many of them are um, very new and still exploring their options and uh, also exploring options in new regions. Um, I consult to people who are bringing in wines from the Republic of Georgia and from um, uh, the Czech Republic and uh, quite obscure areas, formerly obscure areas to the U.S. Um, distributor consolidation um, has definitely be, become a very big part of what's happening today. Uh, distributors want a bigger fo footprint, so they are um, uh, buying up existing distributors in states and creating a network that's, that's much larger, but it still now becomes sort of one company. Distributors usually have their own import licenses. Now, this doesn't mean that they are uh, importing all of their, their own portfolio at all, um, but they have discovered the, um, the benefits of having two margins, uh, the importer and the distributor margin, and as a result have uh, decided to take advantage of that with bringing in their own brands and controlling some of their own product. The internet creates greater transparency, and that's in terms of um, knowing what your competitors are doing, knowing where your wines are priced, being able to research importers and distributors. Um, so there's lots of advantages to it, um, uh, potentially some disadvantages. If a wine is priced at a very low price because it's on special or there was a, they decided to close it out, this could damage a brand elsewhere. But in general, um, it's, it's, a, it's a very good advantage uh, for exporters, importers, distributors, and retailers across the board. 
there's um, greater wine sophistication. By that I mean that people are more willing to um, take uh, uh, advantage of new regions, new styles. Um, they're more adventurous. Uh, boomers are fueling some of this resurgence with more disposable income. Millennials are leading the charge on taking chances on different styles and willing to learn more about wine. Um, and this applies to all regions, not just Australia, of course. Um, so we have we have uh, some obstacles and we have some opportunities. Um, the price tiers are moving up a little bit. They're a little bit more varied now. Um, we've, we're uh, able to, having shed a lot of the, the um, uh, recession um, difficulties, uh, people are willing to sort of expand a little bit more. The exchange rate is more attractive. Now, um, so before uh, we go through to, into some of the other um, exporting opportunities and challenges, I wanted to really be clear about what an importer is. Uh, because even within the US, uh, there's a lot of confusion. I was consulting to somebody one time and we were I was asking them, you have your import license? Yes, I have my import license. We had an entire conversation before I realized they were referring to their Virginia import license, the state of Virginia, that requires a state import license. And they were not talking about the federal import license, which allows them to bring in their wines into the US. This license is called the Federal Basic Permit and is licensed only through the Alcohol and Tobacco Tax Bureau, which is known as TTB. Uh, apparently, they left out the A in that and decided TTB was sufficient. But um, this is the only way in which an exporter can sell to the US is via an importer. Um, and it's the only legal entity that a foreign wine supplier can sell to. Now, each of the 50 states has, un has unlike Europe, where there's, there's lots of cross-border um, sales and distribution, and Australia and New Zealand, where the states and the islands are no impediment to doing business, each of the 50 states has different laws that govern the sales within those states. Um, but the three-tier system is still the common denominator um, for your importer, if we're talking, if I'm talking to exporters here. That is, uh, despite erosion and um, sort of backdoor avenues to uh, importing and distribution here, that is still the law of the land, and um, and it still must be uh, adhered to until it changes. Um, uh, so we've got the traditional supplier-importer relationship. A foreign brand owner can appoint one or more importers, but each importer has exclusive rights to its own territory. In other words, um, you can appoint one for, uh, if, if you're appointing for Ohio, it has to be all of Ohio and, and a foreign brand owner can't appoint uh, anybody else for Ohio. Or it could be a region, it could be the Midwest, Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, and Illinois, for example. Um, they can also appoint um, a, a national importer. And this is not a matter of, of whether it's uh, one is good and one is bad. It really fits. Uh, the needs of the importer and um, and uh, in line with the needs of the exporter. Um, it's the importer who appoints the distributor in each state or distributes in the state in which they are located. So in other words, this is one of the big misconceptions because an importer can only distribute in the state in which they are located if they have a brick and mortar operation uh, with full um, uh, warehousing, uh, trucking, personnel, and distribution. Um, that's the only place they can do it. Now, national distributors can do it because they have bought up or established uh, individual locations in each of those states adhering to the licensing of those states and adhering to the brick and mortar requirements of the state. So essentially an importer imports it into the country and then finds distributors or distributes it in the one state in which they are located. Now a foreign brand owner cannot sell directly to a distributor nor appoint more than one importer in a territory. So if the territory they've been appointed in is the, is all of the US, they can't appoint another one until something changes. Um, or if it's in one state, they can't appoint anybody else in that state. Um, so uh, here we'll get into 
just a brief overview of the three-tier system. I know it's something that's always um, referenced and probably um, had talked about ad nauseum, and I still find people misunderstand it. So I'll just briefly give it uh, an overview of that. It starts in the US. So if it's, if it's a US winery or a US manufacturer of distilled spirits, for example, that is the start of the three-tier system. Or if it's an importer, that's the start of it, not the foreign winery. So you've got the, that's in this case, the importer selling to the distributor who is synonymous with wholesaler. Those, those are the same entity. Importer selling to distributor who sells to retailer, restaurant, hotel, uh, store. Um, that is how the three-tier system works. Now, occasionally we have uh, opportunities to combine a couple of those tiers, but this three-tier system is essentially um, very much in play and very much the cornerstone of the U.S. wine industry. So it's really important to understand that and sort of come to, to grips with it, come to terms with it. Um, the importing options for anybody um, who is uh, exporting um, is setting up your own company in the US. Now, this requires that you must be a US resident. This is either a green card holder or a, a US citizen. Um, and uh, and the, the licensed place of business must be on US soil. So if you're a, let's say, a, you know, a winery in Australia or France or somewhere, and you decide you really want to have your own import company over here, you must have your own place of business or um, uh, appoint somebody um, to do that. So it's, it's not, uh, it is doable, certainly not impossible, but um, that's just one of the options and you have to adhere to their um, uh, to their requirements and often it's an option for a large or, or well-funded winery to hire someone in the US as their representative who's wholly employed by the winery but is established as a US importer. So then we have selling um, or exporting, it's the same thing, to an independent US licensed importer. Now this is the traditional way of going about it. Um, it means that in the first option it means that a lot of uh, wait time if that was an impediment. Um, it takes months to get licenses because you have to get the federal basic permit and state licenses and of course the infrastructure. Um, but it has its own challenges of course when you're trying to find an, an independent US licensed importer. Um, that means attracting somebody who is interested in your wines and moving forward in a, you know, in a, a cohesive way. Um, and then a third option is partnering with a U.S. importer to share responsibilities and benefits. Um, this is kind of a hybrid where you're still the exporter and you still have an importer, but um, you've invested, uh, they've invested in you, you've invested in them, and it becomes a sort of a hybrid where you both have shared benefits and responsibilities. This worked really well with Yellowtail. Um, this is the prime example of something that works successfully. Uh, Yellowtail partnered with WJ Deutsch, and I believe it was in a 50-50 partnership. It was a significant move, um, and I believe sort of a one-time thing that could, uh, you know, that perfect storm of events. WJ Deutsch had a national network of distribution, a uh, long-time uh, uh, network set up. They immediately started plugging that pipeline with wine um, and uh, had a very much uh, um, the uh, um, investment to do it, uh, I mean, in terms of uh, wanting it to succeed. But normally this would be something, it's an option, but it's something that uh, to explore uh, only if all of the components were right. Um, and the fourth option is appointing a compliance importer. Now, this is... Um, it, and there's no such uh, term as a compliance importer. I use it only to differentiate. There's still just importers. But a compliance importer um, is, uh, is, can give you access to the U.S. Uh, they, can, um, it, you know, they can make it possible for you to be here. But it, it, to me, and it's a very viable option, um, it works if you have access to distribution or a demand for sales that you can't fulfill because you don't have a traditional importer. Now that will be mean that you can start filling that pipeline with those sales um, through through having um, a compliance importer. Um, it, it can work if you were making numerous trips to the markets yourself or plan on living in the U.S. part time. 
um, or if you have a trusted uh, representative on the on the, the, the ground, perhaps a brand ambassador or some, an employee, um, if they're, they're not uh, compliance importers, can do a lot of things um, to make it uh, uh, distribution happen. Uh, they don't normally provide um, um, a sales force. So it's, it's an option, but it has to work for you. Um, so uh, here's how not to attract an importer, first of all, because I see this every day. It's a failure to understand how the U.S. market works, uh, resulting in approaching the wrong people. Um, that's just simply a waste of everybody's time. Uh, I, they, they're approaching, it's a Spanish winery, approaching somebody who just uh, imports um, Australian wine, or um, uh, approaching a distributor instead of an importer, or a broker instead of an importer, all of that. Um, a lack of focus on which type of importer and to whom your brand might appeal, um, that sort of goes, that's hand in hand with that first part. Um, a scattershot approach to uh, an unknown and inappropriate list of importers. Um, so that's just, uh, I, I've had a lot of those myself, um, where they just say, dear sir, uh, or dear sir slash madam. Um, and um, uh, not that long ago, I had one that said, dear Frederick. So um, clearly, they had no idea who I was. Um, if you're going, if they, if you're going to feel at all, uh, you know, good about the the inquiry, they have to at least have done some homework. Now, a poor grasp of English in the email, rendering it incomprehensible. I've had those too, and this is not at all to disparage anyone who, where English is a second language, um, this is certainly not my intent. Um, but it, it's it incumbent upon somebody who's approaching somebody in the U.S. either to have an export broker on their end or to uh, to to have have a grasp of English or somebody with a grasp of English to make that initial approach. If it's going to work at all, it has to be comprehensible. Um, a generic email without personalization or to the wrong person. Um, a promotional post in LinkedIn that is non-specific and sounds desperate. And I've seen those. Um, or sounds overly confident for that matter. Uh, I've seen those too where they just say, we're in all the finest hotels of Europe. Um, we need to be in the finest hotels of the US. It's not terribly um, enticing. And a failure to follow up in communication. I think those are, that's sort of self-explanatory. Um, so it's really important to do the homework. It's really important to, um, to demonstrate some understanding of the market and the industry and, and, and instill confidence. Um, finding an importer, looking for the right fit is one of the most important points for long-term success. It takes a lot to, um, to find one. It takes a lot to establish that. Um, it really needs to, um, you know, to reward your energy and theirs. Um, financial stability, and, and by that I simply mean that establishing that they that they can pay for it. Now, this may mean you give them extended terms, or it may mean that um, the um, uh, it, it, something that is is settled up front to establish that they will um, be able to pay for the wines. Um, a like-minded approach and uh, philosophy, so that they have um, uh, a clear vision uh, for your brand. Um, they have, they understand it, um, a portfolio that reflects your area, styles, quality, or has sufficient diversity. So in other words, um, uh, something that's of, uh, you know, the area of um, uh, the, the Australia and New Zealand, or the, um, just understands uh, what they will be um, bringing in, and you understand that they are the right fit for you. Um, a cohesive um, distribution plan. So something that is a clear vision for your for your brand doesn't mean the importer knows exactly what they want to do, but an understanding of the wine styles and the origin, how they fit in the market, how they should be marketed, and a desire to implement a strategy to launch and develop your brand. Um, so uh, it, it means all sorts of things to uh, all sorts of people, the right fit, uh, the right geographical reach, small enough, big enough, whatever is, is, um, is going to fit your uh, particular um, uh, wines and brands. Um, and understanding that you will be an involved and proactive partner um, to, uh, with them to drive sales because relationship is so important. You know, um, real estate uh, always says location, location, location. 
In the wine industry, it's relationship, relationship, relationship. And it's that that's ultimately going to drive your brand and going to drive um, the business over here. If they feel good about you, um, it, it creates a halo effect for the brands as well. Um, now, um, so uh, it could, what does the best fit look like for you? Uh, it just depends on what's going to, um, what your brands are and your regions and that sort of thing. Um, it could be a small to medium with distribution limited to one area. It could be a national importer, brands uh, from your region, brands from your country, and so on. Um, it could be similar or differing styles similar so that they uh, uh, fit within a, a cohesive um, portfolio or differing styles um, could mean that they won't go head to head with each other. So a small portfolio, new or well-established, large portfolio and distribution area. Um, and what are you willing to do to make it happen? So it's those things are all part and parcel of how you will go about looking at what, um, uh, what you're, you're uh, uh, able to accomplish here and, and what, you're, um, uh, what you're willing to do to make it happen. Um, and beginning your search for an importer with a, a list of reasonable requirements will give you a clearer understanding of what you should be looking for, what type of importer meshes with your individual business model, and whether there is potential for a long-term relationship. Um, so search options. Um, and I think that we can't underestimate the targeted trade shows with research and preparation. And I don't mean um, that uh, it's something that uh, you, you know, you look at, at all of the festivals, the wine festivals, and the really fun shows and things. Targeted trade shows, they, they are fun, and they're great when, when you have distribution um, already, but it's you're trying to find this um, uh, uh, an importer, you're trying to find um, opportunities. Um, so um, th this applies to uh, foreign and U.S. trade organizations. It could be Wine Australia. Um, uh, I know I've done on a number of, of um, trade shows with them in the past, and they've been very good. Um, uh, obviously, uh, Beverage Trade Network and um, uh, people who know what they're doing and have a targeted uh, trade component. Um, so whatever you're looking at, when is the event held? Um, uh, it's, in other words, it doesn't go uh, at the, the very busiest time for trade so they can't attend or head to head with another trade show so that it's um, drawing um, uh, people away. Um, where is the venue, um, how expensive is it, um, who is invited. There should be a significant a, a number of, for you, a significant number of importers um, so that uh, you have an opportunity to network. Are you able to get a list of, of um, importers and distributors so you can contact them beforehand, um, target them in a, in a, in a soft way um, so that you can attract them, invite them, and follow up with them. Um, how many wineries are um, exhibiting uh, so that there should be a sufficient number and diversity to make it an attractive event. And um, it's absolutely essential that you have somebody um, a, to represent the brand. They do not have a um, just a warm body because they can't, they won't be knowledgeable and they can't follow through. So it needs to be the winemaker or brand owner or somebody experienced industry person uh, who is able to make decisions is personable, has a reasonable understanding of the U.S. market, and will make the right impression. Uh, additionally, they can follow up and follow through. Um, networking, uh, and this is uh, something that I think that um, it's sort of considered, you consider it like a job, networking for a job. Um, uh, through contacts, through other wineries and vineyard friends, barrel suppliers, shippers, brokers. These are all ways in which you can look for uh, what would be a good, viable importer for you as a brand looking to um, get into the U.S. There are lots and lots of importers these days. There are lots of good ones. There are lots of iffy ones. There are lots of ones that may not be just suitable for your brand. And if you have an opportunity, if you're fortunate enough to have a cellar door tasting room attached to your winery or vineyard in a well-traveled area, um, then uh, you have perhaps an opportunity to have um, interested um, uh, importers coming through and, um, and, and uh, uh, even perhaps uh, uh, chains um, 
that could be like Costco buyer or Whole Foods or any others over here would also be um, applicable. Now, um, the importer or distributor contact and follow up, and this is I put distributor in there because you may have decided to set up a um, an import company here, and your first uh, contacts will be with distributors. Um, just remember this tried and true expression, you only get one chance to make a first impression. You only get one chance to make a good first impression. So um, if it's by email, make it uh, short and succinct. Uh, do not drone on, they don't care. Um, be, uh, demonstrate that you uh, have at least a rudimentary understanding of the market. Know the importer's name so that you don't address them as dear sir or dear Frederick when it uh, should be Dear Madam or Dear Deborah. Um, and uh, uh, establish an awareness of the importer's area of interest or expertise and tailor your approach to their needs. So in other words, indicate how you might provide value to them. Um, itemize the strengths of your, your uh, brand. Where are the importer's gaps in regions or price points? Um, and uh, what niche could you fill? How do your wines compare with what the importer already represents? You certainly do not want to disparage um, anybody uh, or any brands at all. That doesn't make you look good, but you want to know where your point of difference is. Um, and uh, samples, don't just willy-nilly send samples. Um, it's expensive and it's uh, and it definitely uh, they aren't always put to good use. Really determine whether that is an appropriate time. Um, An appropriate follow-up so that these are um, uh, you, you're not hounding them, um, but you are demonstrating interest and you are uh, following their lead. Um, so initially, um, when you've reached an agreement and you've done all of this and you've uh, you've uh, you have an importer, um, you must reach an agreement and understanding with them as to the individual responsibilities and commitments and the terms. Now, are the terms uh, the first time um, uh, they pay up front or are the terms 60 days from bill of lading? Um, are they half on uh, delivery and half at a certain time? Be very clear, but also be clear about what each of you are doing. It doesn't have to be an unwieldy contract uh, that binds everybody up and, and, and you, you can't move forward because it's got so many clauses in it. But just be really clear about it. Um, you know, I, I think there are lots of misconceptions, one of which is that the United States is a nation of wine lovers and population with over 300 million, and your paltry few thousand cases will be swallowed up in no time. It's not true. Um, it, it, it's a nation that everybody's targeting. Uh, there's lots of wine here. Yours has to stand out. You have to find the right importer. You have to have a, come to an understanding. Uh, when you allocate wines, quantities, and vintages, they must, you must be on the same page. Um, be clear about your, your expectations and defer to the importer. If, they, if you've got 20 wines in your portfolio and they want to bring in four, um, defer to them and, say, and don't say, no, no, I've got to have all the rest of these in there. I must have all 20. Or these 16 are, are precious to me. They, I want to find homes for them. No, they're not your children. They are wines that must find um, uh, places in uh, sales in the U.S. and uh, defer to your importer. Um, so this is uh, establish a first year um, volume. This doesn't mean something that is um, uh, you know ground in stone. That is, um, it, it's something that is your importer doesn't have a crystal ball. They can't know what they're going to sell. But establish where you might be preparing now for bottling and labeling and allocating your wines. Um, these are just very minor, they're not minor, but these are just things I'll skip over right now just to give you a brief overview. You'll have to provide a primary source letter, which is an appointment letter to them. You have to obtain uh, FDA registration through FDA.gov. Anybody who exports to the U.S. must do that and submit timely and appropriate uh, information to the importer for the label submission process, which is called a COLA. Um, and label the bottles with approved labels, but only when you have the, um, the COLA, only when your importer said we, TTB has approved the COLA. Be prepared and have wines available for pickup or delivery to the port at the required time. And that may seem, you know, really um, logical and, and, and unnecessary. But I have um, uh, been involved in situations where a truck has been going around a country and picking up the wine and a winery wasn't ready and they missed the boat. 
So make sure that you are um, that you're, you're honoring your commitment. And this is optional, but really important. Provide a sample allowance. Your importer is going to be um, submitting to uh, publications. They're going to be sending samples to prospective distributors. They are going to be um, using samples for tastings. There's lots and lots of reasons why um, they need samples, and they will be exceeding any sample allowance that you give them. So um, look at that as something that is quite essential to do business. Now, ongoing support, um, I, I've just run through this briefly. Um, provide momentum for your brand through tangible support. It can be whatever it is that um, an exporter it has available to them. It could be a very, very tiny winery and there isn't a lot available. I think a market visit, though, is really important. Putting a face to the brand, uh, working with distributors. Again, we're back to the relationship aspect. This is really important. They, if they don't put a face to that brand, and that's particularly true of the distributors, the importer has probably already met you or they have already um, invested in you. The, the distributors and their salespeople must see you, though, as somebody they want to represent. They want to see you as a collaborative partner. They want to see that you are there to, to um, share the burden of sales with them and to provide an impetus for those sales. Uh, the communication, and I say walking the line between stalking and being a good partner because um, you, you don't want to hound them. Everything, believe me, will take much longer than you think it will take. Um, everything uh, uh, will uh, move at a snail's pace, in your opinion. Um, but you want to be interactive. You want to say, what can I do? You want to say, um, here, you know, how are things going? How can I help? Um, what else is happening now? Um, if you can offer incentives, they should be for a, um, a short term uh, or otherwise they'll be accepted as something um, that's the norm. So it, it could be incentives to the importer, to the distributor, to the salespeople or to the retail level. Make it for a period of time. It could be for the launch or it could be for a, um, you know, a three month period or something like that to really um, kick off the brand. Um, useful winery materials. And by that I mean I have seen really, really bad um, uh, uh, what is it called tasting notes, and they really just say, in general, of this region, this is how the wines are. It says nothing about the specific wine. I've also seen uh, a tasting note where they just fill in the vintage each year. So really, we're not talking about anything that that is relative to that um, to that vintage. It should be uh, have tech information as well as um, harvest, uh, aging, um, uh, uh, you know, palate and nose information, things that are helpful to your importer, helpful to the distributor, and helpful to the salesperson. Um, hold pricing for at least a vintage, if not longer. And, and I have seen situations, remember I've been doing this for 23 years, it's a really long time, and I've seen all sorts of things where people decide, wow, I've got this fantastic rating, and uh, I've got to put up prices, or all of a sudden the UK took all of my wine. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm on easy street and I need to raise the price. Worst possible move. Um, it, it, it will kill the, the brand. Um, it will definitely leave a bad taste in the mouth of the people who have already bought it, and now they, they, they can't. Uh, they've established distribution for it, they've made room on the shelves. Just not a good move. Uh, monitor sales through depletion reports. Now, this is important um, in terms of where your wines are actually, um, they've actually sold. So the importer has sold uh, to the distributor. The distributor's picked up a truckload of wine and it's sitting in their warehouse. Does that mean it's going to sell? No. Depletion reports will ensure you that you see um, where that's, that's going. Uh, your, your importer is very interested in that as well and certainly should be able to provide that information. Always try to accommodate distributor schedules when you're coming to visit. And probably should have been up, the, up with the market visits. But uh, obviously you can't come uh, during um, uh, vintage um, or, you know, or your, your uh, wife is giving birth or whatever is going on in your, in your life. But they are making space for you to come and work the market and monopolize the time of their salespeople. So it's really incumbent upon you to appreciate that and to make it happen at their, um, at, you know, at, at, um, at their um, schedule. Be reliable and consistent. Again, it might sound, um, you know, a bit um, trite, 
but um, always follow through, always be counted on, um, be, uh, you know, be, be there as a, as a true partner and keep the pipeline flowing with vintage preparedness. If monitor it with, your, your, with the help of your importer, um, be aware of, of what, uh, how the vintage um, or how the wines are going and how your vintage is going. If you suddenly had wines that were selling somewhere else or in several places or you've opened up new markets, be um, uh, prepared to continue to support your importer in the U.S. or be prepared to back it up with the, the next vintage that it's already bottled and labeled. So um, I've kind of um, I've gone on quite a long time now, and I think those are um, that's the, the subject for today. And if you have any questions, I'd be glad to um, I, I entertain them. Yeah, that was a great presentation. Um, for sure, if anybody has any questions, feel free to type them in the chat there, and we can we can direct them to Deborah. I ha I have one, or Steve looks like he's typing one, so well, let's wait for Steve. Steve, are you there? Ah. Um, well, let's start first. I, that's a great idea, Steve. We can see what, what kind of uh, where we're from and, and all of that in just a second. But in terms of uh, a question for the content, I was wondering if you have a list of importers that are out there in the USA that these guys can talk to or if there is anywhere that you might direct them to. It's one of the hardest parts is actually finding, you know, a, uh, partners that are willing to do new business. So maybe is there something yeah. like that, Deborah? Yes. Okay. Um, it is a hard uh, area. Um, you know, there's a um, uh, there's a um, I have a, a, a book coming out that's a, going to be an exporter's handbook. It's coming out shortly, um, and that will address some of that. But one of the things that you you'll find on the internet is I think it's called. Um, best wine importers or something it's a, it's a list that you buy um, it really is I sorry to disparage them but they uh, it's really just a list of importers um, I, I've seen things on there that um, I don't consider particularly um, you know noteworthy uh, I think that there the, some of the ways that I suggested through networking um, also if you are um, if you know of brands that might have a, some sort of synergy with yours or some uh, or uh, compete with yours or you feel yours are better or they're better priced or they're from the same regions, look for who their viewers, look for their, if they're in the US and look for their importer. Um, that may be, I mean, they may already have, um, you know, a full portfolio, they have sufficient, but it might be an opportunity to um, uh, the you know find somebody who uh, is is willing to look at um, your brand as well. Um, okay, here's a question. Uh, thank you very much, Earl. <laughs> you love my book and you've recommended it. Uh, thank you. Uh, is there a size of winery um, below which it is really impractical to think about selling into the U.S. market? You know what? There really isn't. Um, I think that there, it, it, it's it's up to the exporter themselves. Sometimes people only have 50 cases for the U.S. Maybe it's 50 cases of a really high-priced wine or a really sought-after wine, um, and you know, well, maybe it's 50 cases that they just want to um, uh, consolidate um, with a, an importer. Importers come to them, and they like the idea of saying, I, "I'm uh, I'm distributed in the U.S." So. It's, you would, depending upon the size of your uh, uh, winery or your production, you can limit the area um, that it's distributed over here too. So Deborah, Chris has a question as well. Yes, I see. I'm reading. In your view, is it good or a bad idea to think about launching in a control state? Well, you know, a control state um, simply means that you're, uh, uh, well, sometimes there are control control states that only control above a certain uh, alcohol or uh, distilled spirits. So there are, but essentially there are 18 um, control states. And um, uh, it's, it doesn't matter, you can sell, for example, um, in uh, Utah, that's a control state. Um, now there really is just one buyer, but you can approach that buyer and you can, uh, you know, generate interest and you can present those wines. Um, 
in Pennsylvania, there's a board, but um, there it's um, uh, so wines that go into their specialty stores go before the board, but um, wines can be sold by distributors to um, to restaurants. So I don't think it's a bad idea. It just depends on what your business model you want it to look like, and what it would uh, and and you know what your what state it is. I've uh, I've got one last question. We'll just wait for Chris to stop typing typing and see if it if it is a second part to his question. Oh, uh, okay. Well, that's gosh, that's a presentation in itself about um, franchise state. Just know this: if you're in a franchise state, and again, there are different there are fifty different regulations with fifty different states. But a franchise state essentially, if you appoint a distributor, you can't go, you you, you can't get away from them if they don't want you to. Now, um, there are some states. I think Illinois, um, it triggers uh, the franchise up above a certain number of cases. So it's a lot of cases before you deal with that that franchise law. In Georgia, it's absolutely so prohibitive. Uh, you can't get away unless you petition the board. You can't get away from them for. Um, uh, uh, if they don't sell the wine or if they um, don't pay you. I've dealt with this before myself. Um, and you have to either stay out of the state for two years or um, uh, petition the board and have them grant you the rights to be able to um, continue uh, selling there and get away from that distributor. So so it's kind of, it's definitely much um, caveat emptor in franchise states and just be aware of, of what those uh, laws are. Um, uh, common and linking up with large retailers in the form of private label. Um, yes, well, they do a lot of their own. Um, certainly, uh, one of the ways to, to establish distribution is um, through chains, you know, through um, making presentations to Costco or Whole Foods or the chains in Texas. They're, they seem to be, that seems to be the uh, blueprint in, in Texas is, is large chains like Goody Goody and uh, Centennial and so on. Um, now, so it, it, it's a good idea if you've got the right wine, the right packaging, the right, uh, you know, sourcing and the right relationship. So certainly I wouldn't discount it. It just depends. You must do the research. <laughs>